my name is Maya Gaylor. I am a multimedia reporter here at American Muslim Today. Um, this is our podcast, uh, YouTube show, Muslim Viewpoint. Um, so we're just going to be, you know, talking about your campaign, um, just really, I guess, the issues that we're all kind of talking about, right, whenever it comes to this election. So, so we can go ahead and get started if you just want to start by telling us um, just kind of who you are, background, and how you ended up here. <laughs> okay. My name's Heather Smiley, and I'm a candidate for U.S. Representative in Congress for in 6th Congressional District. And I worked my work, worked my way um, through college as a waitress and in retail and different things. And I was fortunate to have been hired by Ford Motor Company, where I worked for 32 years in international business. Um, so I have quite a bit of experience in working with other other countries as well as the U.S. Um, and my job at Ford Motor Company was really somewhat of a, a fixer. So if, if if I wanted to look for opportunities to make things work better or save the company a lot of money, um, that was my job globally. So I'd like to, I, I my desire is to take that worth towards the U.S. government to make it work better for everybody. And my platform is really um, at a very high level. It's uh, three pillars. One is civil rights. The second is fiscal responsibility. And the third is um, national sovereignty. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, and then so we'll get right down to it. So when it comes to uh, your campaign, you've been very vocal about your discernment with the incumbent, Democratic incumbent, uh, Debbie Dingell. So if you can kind of just tell us, um, you know, what are some specific uh, policies or actions that you maybe uh, would like to either change completely or just implement differently? Um, yeah. Oh, thanks for asking. Um, my, the incumbent and I have very backgrounds. Um, uh, she she grew up in politics um, and prior to getting in politics she actually worked uh, for a nonprofit handing money out whereas my background is very different because I worked in you know like I said I worked you know as a waitress I worked in retail I actually worked in a factory and I worked in the UAW so our different our backgrounds couldn't be more different. From a policy perspective, um, the, in, the incumbent, um, let's just say some of her choices are, in my mind, uh, reprehensible. Uh, for example, in uh, September, she voted against uh, legislation that would prevent people that attack women and children in a, a compromising way. Um, she voted not to punish them and um, let people into the country, even knowing that they've committed those types of things. She's also voted against um, punishing people who commit social security fraud. So if you've been in the country a long time and you're a retiree or you, know, you have grandparents or whatever that are on social security, I think those types of things, you know, people work their entire life for that. They should be entitled to it. So um, she's she's also voted um, um, against um, punishing um, or, or putting sanctions against the the, the Chinese for um, uh, the atrocities they're committed against. Um, the, the Uyghurs in, in China. So I, I thought I'd throw that out as, you know, from a Muslim perspective. She's also voted to um, fund Iran. So, you know, Iran is, you know, you know, there's a lot of uh, unrest going on in the Middle East right now. And Iran is, is funding some of that. And she voted for that. So I'd like to see peace in the Middle East. Um, and, um, 
her her voting record doesn't represent the people or um, our interests globally. Right, and speaking of the people in your district, in your state, uh, Michigan has one of the largest populations of Muslims in the country. Um, I believe it ranks number six out of all 50 states. So, uh, as a candidate who supports, um, you know, heavier immigration laws, even the border wall, um, how do you plan to assist families who are living at home in your district who are seeking pathways to citizenship? Okay, that's a really good question. So, um, you're absolutely right. Michigan has, um, and, and actually I worked my entire career in Dearborn, which is, is the hub of where most of the Muslims live. And um, I don't know if, if it reached the media where you're at, but um, the Muslim community has actually uh, fully endorsed uh, the Republican ticket. Um, and, and President Trump has very, been spending quite a bit of time in the Muslim community here. So from a um, uh, pathway to citizen, citizenship perspective, I'm actually a firstborn American, so my dad immigrated legally to the U.S., so it's something that's passionate for me. Um, the neat part is, is we already have existing laws for um, migrant workers. That, that, that program has been on the books for eons. In terms of people having a pathway to citizenship in the U.S., I actually did quite a bit of hiring um, and had employees working for me that had H-1B visas, for example. So I'm very familiar with the visa program. Um, the, you know, could it be working more effectively? Absolutely. But there is a pathway to citizenship, but there's such a backlog um, there, that there's opportunities to speed that process up. And as you might have noticed, immigration has become quite a hot button issue in this specific election cycle, um, especially whenever it comes to specifically Trump and Republicans who have really been unfortunately pushing a sort of anti-migrant uh, rhetoric with claims of rampant crime coming across. Um, a lot of these claims have been debunked by multiple sources. Um, do you recognize their anti-migrant rhetoric as a sort of fear mongering to possibly um, gain you know, votes? Well, first of all, I, I don't agree with the narrative that you just supplied. So let me kind of step back and, 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 and maybe paint a different view. Um, the Republican Party and including myself, um, like I said, I'm a firstborn American. My dad immigrated legally to the United States. So I am all for legal immigration. I don't like e illegal immigration. I don't like the fact that because we have such a volume of people coming through right now through our northern and our southern border, um, the, the Customs and Border Protection people don't have an adequate amount of resources to vet the people that are coming over. So because they don't have an, an enough resources to vet the people, um, that's kind of where the security risk is coming. We do have, for example, MS-13 and other gangs. We do know that they are leveraging the open borders to um, traffic people, you know, human trafficking. So there is, there is a significant increase in that. And, and that's putting all Americans at risk. Furthermore, the Republican Party introduced legislation that said, for example, um, let's punish people who attack the Customs and Border Protection officers. Because the thinking is, if they're going to attack um, a Customs and Border Protection officer, what would they do to Americans that, you know, don't have you know, uh, a gun on them. And the incumbent Debbie Dingell voted against that. So when you, when you talk about immigration policy, the immigration policy was in existence. And right now we're not vetting the people coming over. And who, 
I find that problem. Right, right. And how would you suggest we improve that process, especially whenever there are dozens, hundreds of families who are detained at the border waiting for, you know, some kind of process either to be told that they can come in or, or go home, many of whom are claiming asylum, um, you know, so how would you approach that specific issue? So three, that's a good question. So three and a half years ago, we had a remain in Mexico policy. So our our borders weren't porous. So we were vetting, we, we had a process and we had the lowest illegal immigration um, influx into the United States in decades. And, and it was fair to everybody because, you know, whether it's the remain in Mexico policy or prior, people like my ancestors, we applied for citizenship ahead of time. So we weren't at the border and we didn't see, you know, the, the human trafficking and the atrocities happening at the border because it simply didn't exist. So there is a policy and there is a process and albeit it could be improved and, you know, everything can be improved, right? Um, but it's just not, it's just not being leveraged. And that's kind of where um, the the atrocities and some of the other problematic things that are happening at the southern border are occurring. Right. Well, we'll move on to a few other issues. Um, so I wanted to touch on uh, the economy, as that's obviously another big issue, um, as many families and individuals struggle to make ends meet, um, you know, working a full time job even or multiple jobs. Uh, as someone who is pro business and pro small government, uh, would you suggest implementing regulations for big corporations who continue to profit, um, you know, as we continue to struggle daily? Okay, let me give you an example, and this will be helpful for your listeners as well. So the Biden-Harris Biden administration on day one canceled the uh, Keystone Pipeline. So I'm going to talk about energy for a second because it does translate into the economy. So they canceled the they canceled the um, pipeline. Well, if you think about it, because I know there's a lot of misinformation in the media talking about price gouging in, in in terms of how costly the price of groceries are, and, and that and that touches everybody. So if, so if we think about that, the farmers need fuel to plow their to plow their fields. They need fuel to plant their fields, they need fuel to harvest the field, fields and get all those crops to processors where it's it's translated into the food that we eat at the grocery store. So if you if you use that example, it's easy to say well, a big company is price gouging for groceries. But as people look at how much they're paying in fuel just for their for their vehicles, if you translate that fuel cost into what it cost a farmer to plant the field and, you know, that whole process, their, pro their prices have gone up because the cost of energy has gone up. So if you translate that into, you know, how much a company is earning, if you look back at the farmer or the family farmer, it costs more to do business, just like it cost us more at the grocery store or, you know, or, or, you know, the economy as a whole. Yeah, so um, how, how else would you, specifically when it comes to your district, obviously, um, if you elected to Congress, what ways, what changes would you implement whenever it comes to, um, you know, uh, cost of living? Okay. So one of the problems that we're having in, in Michigan, and this is not, you know, unique to our state or our district for that matter, is that um, the economy as a whole has, if you look at uh, manufacturing, for example, we're in the Metro Detroit area and you know, we have uh, manufacturing and the automotive industry is really in our area. And if you look at the industry as a whole, most of the jobs now are being shipped overseas. So a lot are, you know, in the southern in the southern border, we have a lot of our manufacturing has gone to Mexico. 
we have a lot of the manufacturing that's gone to India and other countries. So the UAW, in fact, is, um, al although the, the leadership is still sa saying that they're, you know, Democrats, um, the rank and file in the UAW are actually backing the Republicans this cycle because they recognize the job killing policies of the Democrats are resulting in jobs going overseas. So from an economy perspective in our, in our district in, in Michigan, um, we have a tremendous amount of manufacturing jobs that are um, quite frankly going away. So what, what we can do from a policy perspective is to make the U.S. attractive again for manufacturing jobs. So if, peop if we bring back the jobs to America, regardless of what industry, then everybody has a job, everybody can pay their bills, and everybody can thrive. Right. And uh, just kind of moving on to another issue, as you mentioned before, uh, you've, you uh, have either reached out to or been paying attention to the Muslim community in your district. So, you know, I just wanted to ask for our audience, uh, how, how else have you reached out to not just the Muslim community, um, but other faith groups, other minority groups? Um, how are you listening to their concerns and advocating for them? Great question. So actually I have met with the, like I said, um, President Trump has met with the Muslim community in Michigan, but I have as well. And the things that we, we have a lot in common, you know, obviously there's some differences and, and that's normal, you know, in, with any relationship. But one of the key and core things that we have are our values, you know, traditional family values. Um, the Muslim community here is, uh, you know, family oriented. Um, they have traditional values that they've brought with them or that they've, they've nurtured and kept, you know, throughout the generations in our area. And that's something that we hold dear. So from the Muslim community here, um, we work with them closely. Um, I've, you know, I've been working with them for, you know, the, the community for over 30 years. And, um, you know, we recognize each other's um, holidays um, that we celebrate and, and, and harmony. And we have a really good relationship with them. Yeah. And then for my last question, it's, you know, more global related, but it has become um, very close to the hearts of many people here in the States, specifically American Muslims. And, you know, I'm sure you know, since the events last year on October 7th in Gaza, um, many activists, Muslims, Americans have held demonstrations and raised their, their concerns and their frustrations with uh, the Biden administration's support uh, for Israel's government and Benjamin Netanyahu, um, many of whom have since fled from the Democratic Party and are now looking to vote elsewhere, third party. Uh, so kind of what would you say to these voters who really don't know where their vote may, la where may land uh, whenever they go to the booths? So good question. So, so if you look at the Middle East as a whole, uh, and you know, um, I'm actually, I actually was going to take um, a, a, a job there, but it, it turned out that I didn't. So um, I, I have quite a bit of, um, because of my international business experience, I, I really have a good handle on this, or at least I think I do. Um, the Sunnis and the Shias have been fighting for, you know, forever. And, you know, the Mujahideen has, has been in the mix for, for, for eternity as well. So more, more recent events, if you look at, again, th three and a half years ago, we had the Middle East. And not only peace in the Middle East between um, the Israeli and the Muslim community, but we had peace, you know, between the Shia and the Sunnis. It, it, was, a, it was a first. And the, the problem that I personally have is 
the 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 current um, Biden Harris administration um, policy uh, State Department policies really aren't conducive to peace in the Middle East that we had three and a half years ago, and and from a legislative perspective. Um, in the House of Representatives, we have the power of the purse, but we don't control the State Department. So they manage the relationships that we have with other countries. So when the U.S. was strong and had a, a strong international policy, we had peace. We brought people to the table. And I would ask people this. There's a lot of news in the media, but you never hear anything about America's leadership where they're getting the people to sit down at the table and have peace discussions. So although that's not a legislative role, that would be something that I would be a strong advocate for. And quite frankly, I mean, the Middle Eastern people are on the front line, regardless of what country you're in. Nobody wants to see death and destruction, and we all see it in the media. But from a, uh, you know, death and destruction perspective, it's just abhorrent. Where I think we need to do, we need to get back to peace that we, again, that we had uh, just a few short years ago. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Ms. Smiley. Um, would you like to share anything, any closing remarks? Yes, thank you the opportunity. So my website, smileyforcongress.com, that's smileyforcongress.com. And, um, you know, like I said, we we have a huge Muslim community in our 6th Congressional District. And um, like I said, I've already met with them and they're on board. And I encourage um, all of your listeners to please reach out. Um, if they have any questions. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, that's all we have for today.